that's just click past uh, nine o'clock UK time. So should we make a start? Um, can I introduce Fiona Hall, who is, correct me if I'm wrong, the curator at Belton House? Yep, that's right. Good, got that right. I remember that <laughs> on a Friday morning very early. Yeah. Um, uh, Belton House is uh, very near Grantham, which is uh, a town in the south of Lincolnshire, not not very far from, from where I'm sat at the moment, actually. Um, and I'll, I'll leave the rest to, to Fiona to explain to you because I'm sure she'll do a much better job than, than I can. Over to you, Fiona. Thank you. That's fine. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you. It's nice to be communicating out of England for a change, which is nice. Now, I've never done a video presentation in um, Teams, so please forgive me while this is a bit clunky and I try and load up the, the slides. Just tell me if you can see them. Yes. Yes, we can. Perfect. So what Ian asked me to talk about was um, kind of sustainability in a in a sort of cultural heritage environment. So I've got a few slides and I'm just going to talk about some of the things that we've done and some of the things that we're doing. And hopefully that fits the brief. So this is Belton House, which um, was begun to be built in 1685 and it's had a few changes to it over time but it's essentially the same and in the kind of left hand corner you can start to see some of the um, outbuildings that were built in later dates so they were still building things actually up until the 1960s when they created an adventure playground on the estate so i thought i'd take you through and show you the estate and talk a little bit about some of the things hopefully this works there we go so when I'm thinking about sustainability, the kind of three things that I'm thinking about in my role in the National Trust is there's a lot of climate and environmental things that we are really working hard to tackle. So thinking about how we reduce the amount of energy that we use, how we reuse things, how we only um, start to use things that aren't wasteful in a sense. I My job is also really heavily about managing kind of the use of the estate whether that be visitors or anything else we're doing as well as conservation because the estate and everything in it would be dead if it didn't have people visiting but actually the nature of people visiting causes damage so it's always a balance that we're that we're trying to maintain and also i think in recent years the trust has come to the realization that we we can and shouldn't do everything ourselves so actually if we're thinking sustainably long term we need to be working much more in partnership with other people. So I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the partnerships that we've got going. Um, and we are looking at setting up a few more this year as we as we get heavily into this. So need to remember to use the, the, the right key to do it. So Belton has um, as part of the estate, a really large garden. What that is, that picture is of the lake that is down the end of the formal garden. And it is quite big and beautiful. We've been doing quite a lot of work kind of making the habitats better, making sure the trees are okay, tidying everything up. Um, and now a few more photographs. So the top left, is another part of the garden which is the Dutch garden. Um, we've got a little bit of work in that this year where we're going to be replanting some of the lavender and starting to just tidy it up a little bit. It's been we've been sort of open a bit over the last two years but there haven't been that many staff on site so we're going to be kind of intensively going back to doing some of our work. The bottom left is the orangery which is actually a really important building because it's probably the very first steel framed orangery that was ever built in the United Kingdom. Um, it's extraordinary inside and at the moment we we use it for planting but actually we're doing quite a lot of thinking about how we could use that a little bit differently um, in the future. And if you it's a little hard to see, but the top left at the very far back of that photograph of the top left, you can see a building, which is the church that's on site, which we don't own, but we work really closely with the parish council who do own it. And actually we house all of their silver. 
and really important things. And there's a little gate that they can come through and walk down that path to the house through the Dutch garden when they want to pick up the silver for special occasions. So I do all the paperwork and then we walk it back to the church and then afterwards it comes back again. And the orangery is essentially to the left of the church. Um, the lake from the Dutch garden is, is about a mile down um, to the right. On the lake, that gorgeous yellow orange house looking thing is actually the family's boathouse. So they would go boating on the lake. We restored that um, in the 1980s at an extraordinary price, but it's important to restore it properly. It was in a horrendous state of disrepair. So we've taken it back using the crafting techniques that we would have used, they would have used at the time to what it would have looked like when it was built in the early 1800s. It's based on a kind of Swiss chalet style, which was quite fashionable at the time. And we often open that in the summer. And actually to encourage people to use the estate in a slightly different way, we've been experimenting with people being able to rent that for a picnic in the evenings in the summer, which I've done several times and is utterly glorious and you don't want to leave. Because actually when you're there by yourself, Lots of the birds and the ducks and things just come down and you can see a lot more wildlife than you would normally see. There is, um, if you can see on the bottom right, there is another boathouse on the estate, which is the one that, that looks really rustic. It is on the river that's on the other side of the estate. And it's also for boating because the family used to do quite a lot. And we have reintroduced, which is the picture on the top right, punting on the river, um, because it's a nice way for visitors to get to see a different view of the estate that they wouldn't normally get to see. It also takes them through that rocky formation you can see in the background of where the punt is, is what's called the Wilderness Garden. And that was a structure that was built about 1810 by the then Lord Brownlow to create this wilderness garden that that looks extraordinary and the adventure playground is actually on the other side of that. Um, we haven't done punting for the last two years because there was no way we could do it safely but hopefully we'll be reintroducing it this summer and I know people are really keen to get out and go and do it and that goes from that gorgeous little rustic boathouse at the bottom which we also restored about 15 years ago back to its original state. There's also in the um, in the place a huge parkland, which is smaller than it used to be because the family who gave Belton to the National Trust in 1984 um, had sold off various bits of it to try and keep financially stable. But there's still an enormous parkland. And we often have, um, in that section of it, uh, farmers use it for grazing, so we have agricultural agreements with quite a lot of farmers because actually it's better for the land if it's been grazed. But also we have a um, heritage deer herd, which you can see in the bottom left hand corner, which we believe has been on the Belton estate since the 1400s. We've done some DNA testing of it and the DNA matches the deer herd that historically we know it came from, which was one at um, Revo Abbey up in Yorkshire and that would have originally come probably from France we think and we know that that herd is still a very very close genetic match to the original herd which is amazing. They wander the parkland freely. Um, we have gates and things to stop them getting into anywhere that would hurt, they'd hurt themselves but actually when visitors come to the parkland they will often have deer wandering in front of them and coming up to them. And when we're there early in the morning or late at night, we get to see gorgeous things like that of the deer wandering up towards the house. There's also the, um, you know, the big long avenue vistas that you would expect to see. This is East Avenue, which um, has been mostly planted in lime trees, of which on the right is a photograph of one of the three remaining original lime trees, which date from 1640, because the park predated the building of the present house slightly. Um, there are only three of them left, and we treasure them, and the park rangers 
we spend a lot of time looking after them and making sure they're okay. And we've been slowly interplanting other things to recreate that avenue, but give it the same sense that it would have had. And right down the end, you can, in the very distance, see one of the structures that the family built in the parkland to give some structure. And it's actually a place that they would often go and go and have afternoon tea or something like that. We also have a lot of buildings on the estate because it was a working estate. So there's lots and lots of areas, things like carpenters' buildings, workers' cottages. This, the one that you can see here um, on the left-hand side is the old laundry building. So they're what we now call laundry cottages. We have one of them which is staff accommodation because we always have staff living on site in case there's an emergency. And the middle two photographs, you can see is the state of the buildings that they are often in when we when we get them or before we've done any work and we spend quite a long time thinking about how we're going to deal with that what the options might be what what we want them to look and feel like and in this case we're going to convert that one either into a holiday cottage or into more staff accommodation and move somebody from one of the other places and use that as a holiday cottage People being able to stay on the estate for a holiday is actually hugely important because it gives them access to something that they wouldn't normally get because they can get into the gardens um, in the evenings and early in the morning. But it's also nice to kind of live in those places and have them being alive and being used as they as they would have been. And the one in the bottom right is our current big holiday cottage, which is just outside the main gates of the estate. It was the old estate manager's house so it's quite stately it's quite gorgeous it was built probably in the mid 1800s when they redeveloped some of the estate um, there's also other estate buildings so these uh, the one in the middle is the old schoolhouse which is used as the village hall as well as a meeting space for us um, and then the two on the the one on the left and the one on the right are old estate workers' cottages that um, we use for private accommodation. So the one on the right was the school master's house. And it's literally, if you walked from the school, the old village hall, which is the old school, through a back gate and 100 yards, you would get to the school master's house, which is where they would have lived. And they would have nipped through a door into the school to teach every morning. And that would have been the children from the estate and anybody kind of close by. The one on the left is called Bead Houses, which is actually where I live. Um, it's two cottages and it was built in the 1690s actually for, for the widow's houses. So any woman on the estate who had been married and their husband had died or was killed on the estate, they could move into there and then do work on the estate. But it meant that they had accommodation and that they weren't kind of derelict or sent away but because because they were no longer married with a husband they couldn't live in one of the other houses those cottages are gorgeous and they we've quite sensitively um, reinstated them so one of the projects that we've been working on for a few years is a project with a group in England called the Woodland Trust who do quite a lot of woodland development and looking after woodland the in the photograph you can see the tower that you, you could have just seen at the very end of that photograph of the East Avenue. It's called Belmont Tower. And we find ourselves in a position now that the National Trust owns quite a lot of the old parkland, but actually the Woodland Trust owns quite a lot of it as well. So what we've done is join into a partnership so we can join those two bits of parkland together and create something really interesting both for nature but also for the local community so on the right hand side of the slide you can see a, a plan and it was it was the most obvious one to show you but if you don't do plans you it won't make much sense but um some of the you can see the blue sections which start to connect the areas that we own and then the council owns a few bits as well so we've been working really hard to essentially do some work that will join those together. So the vision of the project is to unite the historic landscape 
making it accessible to a wider range of people and providing benefits including improved biodiversity, health and well-being and learning and skills. So what that means is we have developed, we've put in proper paths that are accessible and um, that come, so you can come from Grantham now either on foot, on a bicycle or um, pushing a pram in a wheelchair, anything like that and get to um, what's called Belmont Woods, but actually also there's a cycle path, which is an all-purpose path, which you can easily go around. So we, we've we seen that it's getting many more people out into those woodlands that wouldn't normally have done it. It's also part of it as we are doing quite a lot of interpretation about the history of that parkland area. We're doing some restoration of the historic features. So we've done quite a lot of work on Belmont Tower, which had quite a lot of broken windows and was in a bit of a dire state. And we now have a kind of volunteer workforce that joins with us and op we open those on particular times. There's mo about one weekend a month, there's a guided walk that you can go through the area and talk about the biodiversity as well as the historic features. And part of the project has also been restoring that Eastern Avenue that, that I showed you the photograph of. So the section, there's a section that a road goes through up leading up to Belmont Tower. And there's been a lot of work done to tidy that up and make it into a really good habitat, doing some conservation work, monitoring the wildlife, and just doing quite a lot of work on the trees around that area. That's again a photograph of the lake because the lake is is just at the end of the East Avenue. We also wanted to do some woodland skills training. So the Woodland Trust in particular have um, formed a partnership with a local community group called Hill Holt Wood who work with um, the local job centres for young people who are not in employment or education who want to get into this kind of work and want a little bit of experience. So twice a year, there's groups of them that come and do a course on the site and help with some of the work that we're doing and actually learn quite a lot. And we've just had one of those groups on site over the last couple of weeks um, who have really, really enjoyed it. And I think it's something we will continue to do in the future and actually do a lot more of. So there's just a little bit of information if you wanted to know anything more about the Reconnecting Grantham. If you just search on Reconnecting Grantham, you can find all kinds of um, information because it's quite an interesting project and there's a lot more about it if you're interested. So in terms of the use of the estate, there's a whole lot of other things we do. Oh, sorry, there's one photo. There it is. <laughs> so um, we've had quite a lot of filming on the estate because it's a sort of Regency period house. Um, so it's attracted attention. So we've had Pride and Prejudice, the 1995 version filmed. Jane Eyre, the 2006 film, some of that was done there. There was a Antiques Roadshow visit in 2015. And actually there's an author who wrote a book based entirely at Belton called Moondial. And that was made into a children's TV series in 1988. And the BBC who made it came and actually built a few bits on the estate. So there's a there's a piece in the basement of the house that's with one of the old kitchen bits that they actually built that looks entirely like it's old, but it's built out of wood. It's quite it's one of the fun places we often take family groups. We also are probably having something quite significant filmed here this year. So we're just preparing ourselves for that. Filming is really good because it gets, it makes us some income, but actually it also gets the estate seen in a whole different way. There's a lot of things we need to manage as part of that. And there are some things that we say no to. So we used to have the Burley Horse Trials, which are a yearly event where people would come with their horses and spend a week in the parkland, which made us a lot of money, but actually the damage to the parkland and the biodiversity was so big that we stopped doing it about five years ago. And that's now at another estate that they can do that more comfortably. So we we make decisions based on what what's being asked and how 
how we can manage that and what the impact will be on our estate. Uh, we also do every year a big Christmas event where we put lights. Um, so there's a company that works with us and they put lights throughout the garden, which entirely changes the way the garden looks and feels. Um, we've been working quite hard on this for a few years because also it does do a little bit of damage to the garden. So we've been working quite closely with the company to do it in a way that limits the damage, but actually also make sure that we make the greatest that we can of the features in the garden. It is it is spectacular if you ever get a chance to go. Oh, so on to the house. The, the trust, I don't know if you know this, but in the last two years, the trust has developed a program where we've designated 28 of our places called treasure houses. So that means that they are so significant and the collections that they have are so significant that they warrant being considered a treasure house and that they will have national, if not international, significance. And Belton is one of those treasure houses because the house, as well as the other areas of the estate, is packed full of quite extraordinary things. So I've been at Belton for about a year and one of the things that I found when I got there is that the house is quite dark, which you kind of expect for a house of that age, but not much attempt had been made to do any conservation work that would help the objects or to do any lighting that would help people be able to see them. So we just constantly get complaints about that people can't see things, which, which is fair, because actually there are things that I can't see either. So we've done a few things for the coming season that are going to help us explore how we can make that better. And it's the piece that I wanted to talk about in more detail. So I thought what was easiest is if I kind of produced you some plans of the house and then talk about some of the things that, that we've done. So the basement area at the moment we can only have 50 people in it um, because there is no fire escape so one of the one of my jobs this year is to find a place that we can create entry and access to make it accessible because actually the 50 people that could be in there also have to be fully mobile so it's one of the most interesting parts of the house because it's where all of the staff would have worked there's still all of the rooms are still extant. There's the family chapel. Um, the plate room is where the silver store is. So, and actually Belton has one of the best collections of silver in the United Kingdom. So it it is quite, in fact, it's probably the best collection in the trust. So it's quite extraordinary. Um, all of the old wine cellars are still there. It's... Um, it's an amazing space and an amazing space to explore, but it's quite hard for anybody to get down there. So this last year, we we have an old Arga in there, which hopefully our European colleagues know what that is, but it's basically, a, it would have been an oil-fired or a gas-fired oven that would be on all of the time. So we've worked on, to reinstate that, but the estate, now works off a biomass boiler so we are just converting the last of our buildings so that we had no longer have any gas um, boilers or any oil fired boilers and everything that powers the estate runs off the biomass boiler and the aga now runs off that and we're just we wanted to do it because it it provides a little bit of ambient heat down there because there's no heat at all, which is causing some conservation problems. But actually, it also gives us the opportunity to cook on it. And when we cook on it, we get a whole lot of really interesting sensory things because you can feel the heat, you can smell what's cooking. And we we had all of our volunteers in a couple of weeks ago and cooked some pastries for them in the aga. And we'd sent them all off upstairs into the house to have a look around. And within about five minutes, they'd appeared in in the still room, which is where the agar is, because they could smell the pastries cooking. So it it just proved that it's absolutely going to work. So we'll be exploring that a little bit this year. One of the other things we've done is purchased. So in the bottom left, there are some torches that the trust developed a few years ago that are designed to highlight painting. So 
they provide a really good view of paintings, but actually also there's one type of them that cuts through any of the yellowing or um, varnish that's on an old painting. And you get to see the painting much like it would have been when the painter first did it. So we've invested in some of those this year, which means that we can develop some tours around that. And actually, I think Tony Berry is giving you a talk after this. And if you look in the background, there's a man standing behind the woman with the torches. That's Tony Berry. So I'm pre-introducing him. Um, the next floor in the house is um, the upper ground floor, which is sort of the reception rooms for the family. So it's where the family would have had all of their, the, the dining room, where they would have met the guests, where they would have spent the days. Um, and we are doing some experiments with installing some there. So there'll be a mixture of some track lighting, which is going in the cabinet room, some up lighting, which is going in um, some of the other rooms. And I'm working on how to put some spotlights in a couple of rooms. And I'm going to talk that through a little bit more with a few photos in a moment, because it's proving to be quite an interesting and complex thing to install lighting into a house that was built in 1685. Please forgive the barking, it's my dog. There's somebody just next door doing something. Um, and there are some rooms in the house that we wanted to put lights. So, for instance, the chapel drawing room that I chose not to because it still has its original decoration from 1685. And it's just too complex to do at the moment without quite a lot of further work. The other thing I'm going to talk about a little bit more about in the moment is the saloon, where we have a really important... Orbison Carpet, a French company from the 1790s. And that's been causing us quite a lot of thinking and planning time this year. We're putting a new drugget in there, um, and I'll explain what that is in a moment. But it's this plan kind of helps you see. So from here, if you go out that, if you go out the the steps by where it says upper ground floor, you get into the Dutch garden, which we looked at before. If you go out the steps that are in front of the Marble Hall, you get out into the Parkland, which is where that, that photograph at the start that I showed you of Belton Hall is. And from the saloon, you get this amazing view from basically from the church down to the end of the Parkland. And in order to preserve the carpet, I would need to keep that room really, really, really dark which means you would we would lose that view. And it's one of the really important views to understand how the house sits in the landscape. So we've been doing some work to see how we can preserve the carpet, but maintain the view. And it's proving to be a really interesting, complicated conundrum, but I, I like complicated conundrums, so I'm quite enjoying it. And then the two objects that are here, we are getting out this year to make a big deal about. So the top one is a silver cistern that was made by a man called Thomas Hemming, who was the royal silversmith. Um, and that is considered to be one of the masterpieces of English silver. It is utterly astonishing. But partly the reason it's important is Thomas Hemming was trained by a French Huguenot silversmith and... English silver wouldn't look like it does if there hadn't been that French influence. So because and, and actually it looks much better and is much better because of that meeting of of that kind of crafting skill and the design that was coming from France. So it's a really interesting piece in in that sense. And then the cabinet is our lapis lazuli cabinet, which was probably made originally in the 1640s but came to the family in the early 1700s when the family had gone on a grand tour around um, around Europe and they bought it in Italy and brought it back. It, according to my colleague who is the national furniture curator, it's probably the only example like that in the world in that it's got lapis lazuli entirely on it, whereas often the pieces will have some, but that is completely covered in it and we know which of the mines in Afghanistan the lapis came from and she's still doing some research for me to see if we can establish who made it but it just starts to be a really interesting story about where things come from that we can talk with people about 
and actually make make those objects more relevant, I think, to the modern day. And there's also a first floor, which is mostly where the family would have had their bedrooms, not the children, the family members, but it's also where the library is. So we've been setting up the library so that people can actually sit there and rest and read some things. We have in the library, which is the atlas photograph there, two of these extraordinary atlases that were done by a man called Robert Ogilvy, um, where he produced basically the first atlases of the United Kingdom. And they're, they're not like a, they're not like a atlas that you would think now they're like strip maps. They're just, they're just amazing. So we are going to put those on show and kind of carefully turn pages because they're highly sensitive to light. So we have created a whole display area in the anti-library and have changed the lights because actually the lights would have damaged that we had would have damaged the atlases, so they won't. And then there's a extraordinary bed up there that was woven or, or made embroidered by one of the women in the family, who was one of the founders of what is now I think the British Embroidery Society. And she founded that because she wanted to champion a way that women who had been made widows could earn a living using the skills that they had, which was embroidery. So actually, a lot of her thinking behind it was a kind of social economic piece rather than just that she liked embroidery, which she did. But she made that bed, and that bed is also this year going to have quite a lot of conservation work on it because, to be honest, we're frightened to touch it because every time we get near it, it feels like another little piece of it falls off. So it's well overdue having some nice care and attention. So I talked before about um, the biomass boiler, which we have on site, and it is now, I think, the biggest biomass boiler in the trust. And at the end of this year, we will be the first property in the trust that has completely converted everything to being powered from our biomass boiler. We no longer will purchase any oil or gas for any of our um, places. So the house is fully run on the biomass boiler. Um, but all of the rental properties, all of the holiday cottages and all of the staff cottages will be as well. And as part of that, we've also been converting all of our vehicles to be electric if we can, and also all of our equipment to be battery driven or electric if we can, because we can recharge those easily on site. It's also better for visitors, actually, because if, if you're gardening, you don't necessarily want to see or hear a, a petrol powered hedge trimmer or mower but because the battery ones are actually much quieter and just as effective but for the house one of the things that we're doing this year is that we don't have any heating in either the basement or the attics so they're quite warm in the summer and they're quite cold in the winter and in order to maintain the kind of temperature that we need to maintain we use um, the humidifiers up there and heaters and because of where they are, we end up using um, domestic dehumidifiers in particular. And we go through about 10 to 15 of them a year at least. We did a little calculation at the end of last year, and we think that we spend probably 10 grand on staff time and com um, domestic dehumidifiers. And then we put the domestic dehumidifiers onto a rubbish heap that can't be reused. So we are going to extend the biomass boiler up into the attics and redo the heating system. And that will stop us doing that. It will also stop my staff having to carry buckets of water around a hysteric, uh, historic house, which quite frankly is a bit frightening. Um, and it will make the environmental conditions up there much, much better because we do have a few problems with damp. Um, etc. But to do that, we're going to have to, again, install a little bit of piping and things. So we need to, we're starting to do some planning around how we do that, but it will absolutely happen this year because it's much better in the long term. It will give us a better result, but it actually also means that we're bringing down even further our carbon footprint. Um, so just to explain, so the attics, if you look at the house, the attics are where the roof are, where the windows are coming out of the roof, 
those are the attics, but there's also two levels. There's another level on top of that in the house where that piece that sticks up in the middle is called the cupola. There's another set of attics where the cupola is. And the basement, the reason that the basement is so hard to get a um, door in and out of is that if you look at the very bottom and see the windows across the very bottom of the house, they look like they're only half windows. That's because they are, because half of the room is above ground and half of the rooms are below ground. So pretty much everything in the basement is below ground and you have to go down some steps to get there or come through one of the other buildings on the other side of the house and go through a tunnel because there's a very cool tunnel in the basement as well. So that's, yeah. And those, the doors there are the doors that go into the marble hall. So I thought I'd talk you through some of the lighting conundrums. So we, to put lighting in, there's only particular types of wiring that we can use, which we know don't present a fire hazard because putting anything electrical into a house of this age is a little scary. So we also have trusted contractors who are the only people we'll use. So the guy that does our wiring has wired the whole house. He's worked with us since the 1980s he know, and because he worked with his father who owns the business. So Colin's been doing the wiring himself since probably about 2000. So, and we also have a carpenter and joiner who has worked with us for a very long time, who knows how all of these structures work. So where the lapis cabinet is, to get some wiring in there to put in some spotlights, we think we're going to have to lift some of the floorboards and take a little bit of the panelling off and put the wiring in and then very carefully put it back. And we... We try and reduce the amount that we do of that. So we also, when we're doing it, if we've put anything else in, because when we lift the floorboards, we damage them slightly. So we always try and go back to the same floorboards because we know we can get them up without damaging them. So whenever I think I want to put a light there, there's a whole lot of other things I have to think about. We're very confident we can get some lights where the lapis cabinet is. The picture on the left is the library and what you can see is one of my team standing up on top of the library shelves because we went in there to do a really big investigation because I wanted to put some lights around the edge of the top of the library that would illuminate the ceiling because it would just give it a lovely soft glow and make it feel really interesting. We know that there's a very big ledge up where Sally is but there's not one down the sides, so we don't have anything that we could safely put a lighting track on. And we don't like to put things in that are artificial without quite a lot of thought because it's a historic space and we need to we need to think about that quite carefully. So we looked at putting some uplighters on top of the book stacks, which is one of which Sally is standing on. But we then discovered that the only place in the library that has any electric points is on the right-hand side, and we would have to do a huge amount of trunking, if any of you know about electricity work, to get the wiring across to each of the bookshelves. And I would have to find a way to hide all of that in in the bookshelves themselves. So it actually became a huge, huge, huge job. So we've decided not to do the library this year and we'll keep planning to look at how we can do it. But it does mean off the back of this that actually the team have got up on ladders and scaffolding and looked at most of the rooms and photographed most of the areas so we know how we can do some of that. And also we've now got a plot of the entire house of where every single electrical point is, if it's live, what it was used for so that we can do a lot more intensive planning about how we run electrical wires. I sort of, I got about three months into this and realised why nobody had ever put lights in the house before, but I refused to be stopped by that. So, um, And the other big thing that we're dealing with is a saloon carpet. So please forgive the slightly murky photograph on the left, but that's a saloon. And you can see the carpet down. You can also see probably how light the room normally is. So we always measure 
the light hours that we all of our rooms get. And we know the saloon is way over its light hours that it should get in the year. So it should be darker because it's very slowly fading that carpet away, but also starting to make it fray a bit. Um, but if we make the room really dark, it it really affects how the rest of the rooms around it work because as a saloon, it's one of the main access ways that you would have in the house. And actually as a room, it's designed to be used in the daytime as a kind of meeting space. And then in the in night, what they would often do is roll back the carpet and have dancing in a saloon like that. In the summer, not the door you can see, but the one opposite, is a, is a window door that would often open and people would go from the saloon out into the garden and then come back in and sometimes have tea there, sometimes go around to one of the other rooms to have tea. So if we kept it dark all of the time, it would also potentially alter the way people see the room, which doesn't mean we wouldn't do it, but it just requires requires some thinking and some design. You can see um, there's a red carpety thing that's that's fully red which is a drugget but actually this is quite an old photograph what we had there was a was an eye mat that was designed to look exactly like the carpet um which we thought would help so people could walk on the eye mat but actually the eye mat's done quite a lot of damage to the carpet because it probably wasn't installed correctly but also what eye mats tend to do what druggets do is when visitors come they create quite a lot of dust um, and dust is sort of the enemy of historic spaces, but historic spaces wouldn't make sense if you didn't have people in them, so we need visitors. But they create a lot of dust, and a drugget contains the dust within the drugget, so you can vacuum the drugget and get most of the dust out. What an eye mat does is push the dust out into the room, so it tends to make the room quite, quite dusty. And when you've got dust, if you don't have a good... Um, pest management system you can start to get pests and also mold growing if you have any problems with your temperature and humidity and given that the basement which is directly below this room doesn't have any temperature control that ended up being a little bit of a problem so we've lifted the eye mat we you can see the carpet which is utterly beautiful on the right hand side and then we've started to do some work to understand how we deal with the carpet in the future so this is this is what we affectionately call our Caravaggio workpiece. so that's one of the staff who was starting to do some work in the winter when it was freezing in the saloon so she's starting to do a deep clean of the carpet and because we just try and limit light um, at times we started doing it just with some of our lights in in situ. Um, and this shows you what we actually did. So we gridded out the carpet and vacuumed every single square quite carefully for the same same amount of time. And you'll see little bags laying on each of the squares. So when we vacuum the square, we take whatever we found from that square and put it in the bag so that we can know what came up, which is partly how we know there was a huge amount of dust further out on the edges of the carpet. And also how we know that there was a little bit of mold growing in some of the corners, which we've dealt with now. Um, so we've done all of the vacuuming. We've now lifted all of that string and we've plotted in for a new drugget to go in. But next week I have um, one of the trusts T uh, conservation studios who focuses on textiles are coming to spend a week in that room to do me a really good condition report of the carpet so I can understand what to do. Because our original idea was we wanted to roll it, but when we realised how far, how big it is and how far we were going to roll it, we were going to end up with a carpet roll that would be about three or four feet high and actually we would potentially damage the carpet as it lay on top of it. And we also potentially would have created more problems with light as some of it got more light than others. So we, we may have exacerbated that problem. Then we thought we might cover it completely with um, something and with a proper backing under it. 
which and, and we could have something reproduced that looked like the carpet, but actually that could also potentially damage it. So until I know the full condition of it and know what we need to do, and I suspect we will have to lift it at some point, package it up, and send it away to be cleaned properly. And I think actually the place that we send them to clean is in Belgium. And then when it comes back, it will need quite a lot of conservation work. So for us, it's kind of a five or 10 year plan for conservation work that we would also look at ways that we could share that with visitors and talk about it in a in a really interesting way. What we did find is that actually, as we talked about it on the estate, people got really excited about the carpet and what we were doing. So the man you can see there vacuuming is actually our facilities manager who never does conservation cleaning, but was so excited we had to save him and a few others a square of carpet so they could come over and vacuum it, which is great. And when we redo when we redo the drugget and when we check the carpet, we are intending to do that in front of our visitors so that we can talk a little bit about the carpet and actually why it's important and why we need to care about it that much. And you may also notice that Nick there isn't wearing any shoes. So we never allow anybody to walk on that carpet with shoes. You always have to be in stockinged feet. So actually the team, when they've been working in it over the winter, have just been in slippers. So they we bought them all a set of slippers so they only have slippers that they use in the house and they it keeps their feet warm because it has been very cold that's kind of the end of what i wanted to talk about i just thought you might like this drawing which shows um kind of the the house some of our deer some of the other gorgeous things that we've got there and i just put up our kind of who i am and you this is my email address if you wanted to contact me but also our social media and website pages if you wanted to go and look at anything more fully. On our Instagram page actually is a little video of the team moving the lapis cabinet, which is fab. I couldn't figure out how to download it onto this, but it's really fun to look at. And we keep putting updates on there as we're doing things. So you, you'll see things through the year. I hope that was, hope that was interesting. Is Thank anybody- you, yeah, yeah, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, any questions for Fiona? Or Helly? Hi. Yeah, I just had a short question because I didn't, or maybe I missed it. But um, what do you do anything with with schools, with students? Um. Like so it's a really good question, Helene. I didn't talk about it, no. So we we used to have a very big learning department and we would have quite a lot of school visits come on site and that team would deal with that. And, and you may know that through um, the pandemic, the National Trust did quite a lot of restructuring and quite a lot of staff were let go. And the learning team was one of those teams that were let go. Um, so... We're not set up to do it at the moment, but one of the things I'm starting to do with the new teams that are in place is us think through how we how we interact with schools and actually universities and students doing things. So we still get a lot of requests to do things. So for instance, the University of Lincoln has a film school and I think I have four requests at the moment from students doing their film school things to come and film at Belton. So we're just working through that. We do have a lot of schools that come on site that do things. We just don't have the capacity at the moment to do things with them, but we provide them with ready-made things that they can come on site. And definitely things like reconnecting Grantham, there are a lot of school groups that are going to that. And actually there are kind of volunteer-led tours that they can do. It's something I think we'll develop more of in the future. And when we get requests, we do everything we can to meet them, but we don't actively go out and look for that at the moment. Yeah. No, it's, it's, okay. it's just, in, I, was, I was interested because yeah. what, what you're talking about is really interesting yeah. to look at it with students too. Uh, yeah. On yeah. Any yeah. You know, yeah. sustainability, landscaping, uh, history. Exactly. Which is one of the reasons we were keen to do this and kind of talk about the work. And I, I kind of make time to do as many of these sorts of things as possible because actually a lot of our volunteers in the future will come from those groups. And actually we've got we've got a lot of requests at the moment from kind of 
school children who want to come and do some volunteering work for various things. So I I make space in my calendar to make that happen um, with either me or the team, just because it, it is important. It's really important. Yeah, I think so. Okay, thank you. I think you must have covered every base, Fiona, in your <laughs> presentation. I left everybody speechless. Wow. Any more questions? It's quite early in the morning, Ian. So it is, and it's Friday as well. I'm very, it is. Very so aware it's Friday. No, absolutely. Do if if anybody does have questions that they think of afterwards, do feel free to kind of drop me an email. If if you didn't catch the email, Ian has my email, so and I'll yep, happily yep. chat about things or answer things. It's lovely. Helene, have you got another question? Yeah, I just I just thought of something else. Uh, uh, do you do anything with, with digitalization of your collection? Perfect question. Um, <laughs> we we haven't in the past, and the trust I think has been quite slow getting on to digitization, but we will need to do it in the future and we're doing we're doing bits of it. I I have a personal bugbear because I've come from other kind of big national museums who do proper digitization that often people put things on a scanner and scan them at 300 DPI and think they've digitized it. And actually they haven't, they've just scanned it. Um, mm. And it it's not useful for a whole load of things. So we, we do some reproduction for things. So we have quite a lot of researchers that write and ask us about things in the collection. And we've been doing quite a lot of that in the last couple of years. So we will photograph things and send them. But we will in the future start digitizing some things. And then I, what I didn't talk about actually is that our roof is leaking a little bit, which is partly what gives us the opportunity to put the biomass boiler through the attics. But when we do the roof, which will be in the next three years, one of the things that I've highlighted in that project is I want to create a system that gives us really good Wi-Fi through the house because it's a historic building. So if you're sitting underneath a Wi-Fi um, piece, you'll get it. But if you move away, you don't. So it's, it's really bitty in the house. But that would then also allow us to start producing some things that visitors in particular could access in their own right. Um, and we can produce a lot more content that would be really interesting that you could get anywhere in the house. For me, it would also mean that my team at the moment, if they're doing any cataloging, they're often going up four or five flights of stairs, writing written notes, coming down four or five flights of stairs and updating it on a computer, doing a printout and then going up again. So they waste quite a lot of time and energy just working really inefficiently. Whereas if I had Wi-Fi, they could just take it with them and do it up there. Yeah, yeah so, it's just because we noticed that we get lots more questions as a school too from teachers yeah. who that with yeah. the pandemic too, they, they've learned to, to yeah. work in a dig, yeah. more digital way and the yeah. students like it. Yeah, uh, no, it's really good. And we're, we're just starting to experiment a little bit we're doing some um, audio tours on site to using a an app that we can put things into and people can download themselves because you're right people people have got used to that but actually also they want to access information in different ways and on their own not have us kind of tell them how they should do things it's it's much better that way so it'll take us a little while to do because the trust is sometimes like turning the titanic but <laughs> we're getting there so and it is definitely stuff for the future. And mm -hmm. yeah, it'll be happening quite soon at Belton if I have my way. Thank you. You're welcome. Super. Cool. Antonella? Uh, if I may complement the conversation, the, the question about the digitization, I think that uh, one aspect that is uh, becoming more and more evident when uh, dealing with the digitization of a collection that exists per se in a physical space is uh, to conceive digitization not only to, for the production of uh, a series uh, of uh, JPEG images, but to think that digitization already is a kind of 
memory twin, yeah. a, a reconstruction of the building with its decorations, interiors, tapestry, everything that we have seen in your presentation, that is accessible online yeah. uh, in a way that adds information to the visit because it misses the digital, the virtual visit, the uh, physical dimension. So the digital visitor can have other experiences that complement the lack of the physical experience. Yeah. Yeah. So to think to the digitization in two terms, I think I would suggest one is to complement the visit of the visitor of the physical space yeah. and to complement the services to the people working in the digital space, as you correctly said. <laughs> so something that happens in the physical space and that through digitization adds more, adds some value, but also to conceive a visit of uh, the space fully in the digital world. Yeah. And this implies not only to have a series of files, one after the other, but to have these files connected through stories, uh, um, context, uh, historical information. And this is becoming more and more demanded. We, we are having in these days discussions with the, the partners in Europeana about what is going to be the European digital space for cultural heritage. Yeah. Well, the experience of Europeana is demonstrating that just the uh, putting together millions, tens of millions of objects is not enough. We need to connect these objects through stories. Yeah. So it is just a, a, a vision towards your next digitization. I completely agree. I, I couldn't have put it better myself. I think that is fundamentally important and where where I think we're going, but we're starting from quite a low a low place on that ladder. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. I think that's it by the looks of it. Can I just thank you once again, Fiona? Thank you so much for giving up your time and doing this for us. It's very greatly received. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. OK, thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you.